Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever and wherever you are, and we're back to that wherever you are part. Uh, greetings to you and welcome to the Highland Congregational Church's virtual worship service for Sunday, January 16th, 2022. This is the second Sunday after Epiphany, and we find ourselves back in virtual worship. Due to the unprecedented spread of the Omicron variant of the COVID virus, this is where we are today. And so I hope you're comfortable and finding yourself safe and sound. This spread has led to an increase in unprecedented number of cases and hospitalizations. Um, it has affected my family in the last week uh, since we were together last. Some of our family members have tested positive and experienced mild symptoms. And given all of what was happening, I think quite wisely, the executive board of the church council voted unanimously last Sunday to pause in-person worship for at least two Sundays, this one, January 16th, and the next, January 23rd. Um, we will reevaluate at that time when we might resume, either on January 30th or as soon as we can responsibly. And I do look forward to this soon. There are early indications and modeling going on that this surge may plateau somewhat quickly and decrease shortly. In light of that, Please pray for our world and our community uh, and to take that very seriously, as well in particular as the healthcare workers who are absolutely wiped out, uh, as I know firsthand. In all of this, do know that God is good. That doesn't change things one bit. And we will have the treat of working with a unique passage from the Gospel of John that Jesus is certainly good. In fact, even excellent. So settle up. Join us for worship and rejoice, knowing that God is seeking to do good for you and all people at all times. Welcome to worship. A reading from the book of John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern of, is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars standing for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water and they filled them to the brim. He said to them, not dr now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Thank you, Mary Beth, for reading our scripture for us today. Six huge jars of wine on the wall, six huge jars of wine. You take one down, pass it around, five huge jars of wine on the wall. And apparently... It was the good stuff. We can never hear too much about the goodness of Jesus, the love, the creativity, the generosity, the clear and overwhelming evidence that Jesus brings joy to our lives and our world. This passage makes it so clear that Jesus loves to celebrate with people, that life is rich indeed. As the kids would say, Jesus knows how to party. No more baby Jesus, my friends. As we've noted, there's not a lot about the infant or adolescent Jesus in the Gospels or anywhere else. It's on to the 30-year-old Jesus and his gang of merry men and women where the story gets picked up. The Gospel of John works this way. The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us as a fully formed adult for our intents and purposes. John then somewhat follows basic aspects of the story in common with the other three Gospels, 
if in rather different order and much of it smushed into chapter 1. John the Baptist prepares the way for Jesus. Jesus calls some folks to follow him as disciples. And we're off. So what is Jesus going to do for his first act? That first big impression. Well, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Here we go. Cana is close to Nazareth. 10 miles or so to the northwest, and it looks like Jesus' mother is the primary connection as she was listed first. But unlike those RSVP cards that we sometimes get for weddings, you know, the Professor Plum and Miss Scarlet request the presence of the most reverend Bill Morey Holmes plus one at their wedding, here pretty much everyone would be invited. And so go Jesus and his disciples, and probably most folks in the surrounding villages. Weddings were important communal celebrations in Jesus' time, as in our own time too. But they may have been bigger deals then, and the text does give us some hints. It was taking place on the third day, Tuesday, which means that it was far enough away after the Sabbath was over on Saturday for people to travel to the festivities, and also that there would be enough time to do the setup. They had to set up, of course, for what was going to then be a multi-day affair of eating and of drinking and of dancing and pageantry and of sleeping it off a bit and then getting up and doing it all again the next day. Comparatively, we modern folks are actually pretty tame. Most of the time, there is the wedding ceremony at a convenient time and a reception of some sort immediately afterwards. And in all likelihood, it's probably going to be Saturday and likely in the afternoon and maybe with a meal to follow. Maybe some dancing. I used to officiate a lot of weddings when I was working with young adults. We'd get to the wedding and the reception and usually Mary Beth and I would need a babysitter for more than about five hours, tops. We could catch up with friends and meet new ones, eat a nice meal, people watch, maybe have a drink. Then we'd go home, pay the babysitter, and get to bed at a decent hour to be up early for church the next morning, almost always a Sunday. Now, our forebears in first century Palestine may have been pretty different. They knew how to party. And using this example, they'd start on Tuesday and go at it until they had to head home in order to be off the road in time for the next Sabbath, the next Saturday. For a wedding, community life and work stood still. It was to be a great celebration. And with no apologies to our Puritan predecessors, these folks sometimes partied hard. Which brings us to our wedding here in Cana, for we learn rather quickly that at the party, disaster almost strikes. The booze had run out. The booze had run out because they had drunken all of it. We don't have breathalyzer records from the aftermath of this wedding party. Suffice to say that consumption was high, and so were the spirits, if you know what I mean. Now, we nice church people tend not to understand just how big a problem the wine running out was. Serves them right, we think. They need to learn a little moderation with the fire water. Bunch of lushes. There's probably a 12-step program nearby for them. And indeed, because of the very real health problems of alcoholism and some misguided morality, there are more than a few current Christian denominations that frown upon drinking at all, including a notable one that is more or less centered here in the Inland Empire. But that's not what's at stake here, and it is certainly not the judgment of Jesus. For many folks, times of joy call for some lubrication. Folks in Jesus' time were no different. In fact, wine was a consistent symbol of the joy that God brought to his people Israel, of good times and of some degree of prosperity. In earlier human history, in order to grow grapes that were good for wine, a civilization had to be somewhat stable. They had to have made it, as it took several years for the vines to mature 
to produce a decent fruit for wine. We find this all over the Hebrew scriptures. Jerusalem is regularly referred to symbolically as a vineyard where God's blessing and joy may be found. So it was a socially given expectation that one hosting a wedding banquet would have wine and plenty enough of it. Anything less would be shameful in a culture where hospitality, providing for one's guests, was of utmost importance. And here we find ourselves with the wine having run out because they drank it. Uh-oh. Somebody's going to look bad here. Most likely the groom and his family who were to have been responsible for the festival's provisions. Jesus' mother notices this problem as mothers are sometimes wont to do and gives Jesus the heads up, very motherly like. They have no wine. And Jesus responds very much like any put upon child. Ah, oh, ma, jeez. What do you want me to do about it? It's not my problem. He even says something confusing about his hour not having come yet, uh, which probably rekindled his sweet mother's hopes that her 30 something bachelor's son might someday want to get married, like all good boys are supposed to. And yet he does something, perhaps goaded by the persistence of his mother, who seemingly ignores his snarky response. To the servants, she says, do whatever he tells you. So in a rather comic turn, they had nearby doing nothing. Six large stone water jars for Jewish purification rites. 20 to 30 gallons capacity each. Maybe about my size. Fill them up with water, says Jesus. And they did. To the tops. Now draw some out and uh, take it to the chief steward, you know, the, the wedding organizer, the guy who's essentially the sommelier. He'll swirl it, give it a taste, check the wine's nose. So off they go. And lo and behold, the wedding planner discovers that it's the good stuff. Wait a minute. This is the good stuff. How much of it is there? Those six massive jars worth? Huh? You're supposed to put the good stuff first when the guests still have taste buds that work. You put the box wine, the two buck chuck, out when they're hammered, like they all are now. Three sheets to the wind, plastered, plonked, bombed, tanked, downright drunk. Nobody is going to be able to tell at this point that this is the fine wine. Heck, probably some of them don't even know who they are at this point. But I guess the party can go on now. Uh, thanks. Jesus made the good stuff. When most folks wouldn't know the difference. I guess he's just that kind of guy. Now, I am not a sophisticated person when it comes to wine, and I'm certainly not an expert in the slightest, though I enjoy a glass of red now and again. I do have friends who are quite savvy about wine, and they've tried to teach me some things over the years. And it started when I was in college, and I had a friend who had a bunch of us over to his parents' home for an overnight of watching movies. And his dad was quite a wine guy, a heart surgeon, who had done a good bit of research on the health benefits of tannins in red wines in fighting heart disease. Indeed, he had done a lot of research and had spent a lot of money in amassing quite a wine cellar in the basement of their home. He enjoyed teaching people about wines and how to taste them, so downstairs we were marched to get a lesson. Several bottles were already in brown bags to make it a blind taste test, and there were cheese and crackers for cleansing the palate after spitting out the tastes. Now, there was no need for most of this, as I and most of the others were all savages and knew next to nothing, but it made for a very nice atmosphere. So he poured, and we sipped, and we swirled, and we sniffed, and sure enough, some of the differences became evident when he pointed them out to us. Too sweet too medicine-y, too metallic, too harsh, 
bad finish, and so forth were his verdicts, and in comparisons, these judgments made some sense, I suppose. When he got to the last bottle, he poured and we sipped without comment. And then he asked, given everything that I've taught you so far, what's wrong with this wine? What do you taste? We all thought hard about it and couldn't really come up with any answers. It wasn't too sweet or too medicine-y or metallic or harsh or anything else that he had taught us to judge. We didn't know. To which he replied, that's right. There's nothing wrong with it. It's an excellent wine. And he pulled it out of the brown bag and it was a bottle of Chateau Mouton Rothschild one of them with the Picasso label on it. And it was probably worth more than the piece of junk car that I was driving at that time. We took that bottle upstairs and uh, finished it off while watching the movie. There's no question that the excellence of that wine, the excellence of how good it was, was mostly lost on unsophisticated me. And there's no question that the quality of what Jesus made at the wedding of Cana was mostly lost on the besotted guest who would polished off all the wine that came before it. For all of the immediate benefits at this wedding party, the guests can now keep drinking and the groom's family doesn't look shamefully look like inhospitable cheapskates that don't know how to throw and prepare for a proper party. The miracle itself occurs rather discreetly behind the scenes, if you will. The miracle, the first of his signs in the Gospel of John, is known to us because John puts it forth prominently, right off the bat. First impressions, my friends. With Jesus there is joy and there is abundance, and looking out for those who might otherwise be ashamed amongst their community. Religious folks sometimes get a reputation for being uptight, fearful, controlling, pinched, judgmental, and sometimes this reputation is very much deserved. But how can that possibly square with this, the first of Jesus' signs in the Gospel of John? Maybe something's missing. Maybe it's better to taste afresh what Jesus is doing. Maybe, as the text says, we'll even find the glory of God this way. To life, Laheim.
And now, as we prepare to conclude worship, hear these good words that we hear each week, words of hope, words of strength, words of goodness that give us back into God's arms. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and asking earnestly with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Go in peace.